you know, I feel blessed to have the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I hope to maybe give you a sense of the kind of thing that I'm interested in and the kind of concerns that I have. Uh, just observing the Muslim community uh, in recent times and trying to understand certain trajectories. And I think that as believers, we have to have a long-term vision uh, for our community. And we should not be thinking in terms of what's going to happen this year or in the next five years or even in the next 10 years, if we can even think that far. But perhaps we should set our vision to what will the Muslim community look like in 100 years' time. And that's only one or two generations, maybe three generations time. So if you have a concern for your children, if you have a concern for your grandchildren or great grandchildren, then you are thinking in terms of a hundred years. So what are we doing now and how are we thinking about things now and doing things now that's going to affect our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren? And of course, you know, I don't need to share with you all the examples that we have of the MBA having this kind of concern. Most notably, Ibrahim alayhi salam, who was making dua for his, uh, for his children and the coming generations. Uh, so this is the kind of mindset that we have, and it starts with seeking the uh, pleasure of Allah and seeking his guidance. Uh, for not only ourselves but our children and, and, and the coming generations, inshallah. What is, I think that if we have this attitude, then a lot of the things that we see today should be very alarming to us and should be very concerning. And so that's what I would like to share with you. The thing is that we live in unique times. We live in unique times and we're facing unique challenges. And one of the things I often talk about, as Sheikh Mateen mentioned, is modernity. Modernity itself is something unprecedented. The attitudes that we see today, the ideologies that we see today are unprecedented. We haven't seen this kind of thought process, uh, attitude, understanding of the world and of what human, being a human being means morality, ethics, we haven't seen this, and the Ummah has not witnessed this, perhaps humanity has not witnessed this for uh, all of human history. To give you an example, one of the things that really distinguishes modernity is you'll notice that it's not based on any particular uh, explicit philosophy. It's not grounded in a philosopher like a particular individual. For example, if I say Confucianism as a philosophy, you know that that's based on the teachings of particular Chinese thinker named Confucius, right? If I talk about capitalism as an idea, there are certain concepts of capital and so forth, markets, the invisible hand, Adam Smith, and all of this philosophy. You have a set of books, a set of ideas. But modernism is not like that. Modernism means that whatever is happening now is the best. Whatever is happening in the present moment is the peak of human existence. Humanity is constantly progressing, improving year after year, generation after generation. Things are evolving and evolution is good, change is good. If you are not changing, you are falling behind. You are falling, uh, you are on the wrong side of history, right? This is the expression that we hear. Are you on the right side of history or the wrong side of history? Okay. Or people will say, oh, what year is this? When they criticize something as being crazy or stupid. Oh my God, what year is this? Are we still doing this? Right? Just by referring to the time, you're able to make a moral judgment. Right, So this is what characterizes modernity, and it is unprecedented. And you'll notice that a critical, crucial aspect of what modernity means and, and the implications of modernity is its, uh, it is the antithesis, the opposite of tradition. 
the idea of tradition because what is tradition let's think of it as Muslims our values as Muslims comes from where where do our values come from of course from revelation from the Quran and the example of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam yes but where where is this revelation when does the revelation descend when does Jibreel alayhi bring the revelation it's in the past right it's in the past. so how does it come to us did we get the revelation on a you know flash drive that we can put on the computer and you know see what Allah says no it comes through men it comes through a tradition of teaching and scholarship a community okay a community of believers men and women this is how we are able to know what Allah has said and has commanded us and informed us about the nature of reality so we have to have tradition if we cut ourselves from tradition then we cut ourselves from revelation so just in this way okay just by looking at the concept of modernity and comparing it with its implications we can see it conflicts very drastically very critically with Islam just on a very basic level but furthermore the idea that humanity is on a continuous march of progress what does this mean do we believe this is this the reality is humanity improving morally is humanity humanity improving rationally both of these are important why I think Muslims I think mashallah you you all have uh, are taking classes you're studying and we have this idea that okay morality is not improving the state of humanity is decreasing it's getting worse and worse as we get closer to Yom al Qiyamah and there are signs Ashrat Asa that indicate how we have how the state of humanity has devolved morally but what about rationally has humanity rationally devolved or is it purely on the moral and spiritual level first of all to even understand this question we have to understand the connection between rationality and spirituality rationality and morality because we don't we understand a deep connection between the two as Muslims okay? because what is what is reason what is aql? we don't have to make it complicated okay? aql just means to recognize the truth to recognize reality as it is can you be a rational person if you do not recognize Allah can you be a rational person if you do not recognize the status of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam can you be a rational person without submitting to your Creator and recognizing that you are owned by him and that you will return to him can you be rational really <laughs> of course not and Allah is saying this to us over and over and over and over again in the Quran okay. so rationality and spirituality are, are connected okay. and much of what is considered to be rational in today's day and age is the opposite of such okay. is that in fact deeply irrational irrational how how do we define rationality anyone what was that well no what did I just say what is rationality true aql to recognize reality to recognize reality as it is okay so rationality and morality are connected is human ra rationality improving increasing no many things that we can say about this many indications but the very simplest of them is if people are getting further and further away from Islam 
further and further away from the truth, haq, then they're not rational. They're getting further and further from rationality. So many of the things, you know, I, I was just speaking at a high school yesterday, talking to these teenagers, and what I told them was that we are living in a clown world. We are living in a clown world. And they asked, well, what do you mean by this? So a clown is someone who is joking, someone who is goofing off, someone that is acting silly and irrationally. And that's the kind of world that we're really living in. It's a clown world. Things that are supposed to be so obvious and so clear, clear cut, are now confused. And the opposite, what was considered good is now considered bad. What is considered bad is considered good. People are enjoining evil and forbidding good. This is the state of the world. And it's happening among non-Muslims, amongst the kuffar, around the world, and it's influencing and impacting the way that the believers think. Not all, alhamdulillah, but some. Okay, and so we ask Allah to protect us from this, Ya Rabb. So, um, what I'd like to talk to you about is a very simple subject. I want to focus on one aspect of our current situation and the kinds of things that are being promoted within the community that I be strongly believe and I hope to convince you are going to lead to bad results, are going to lead to very bad results for our children and for their children and so forth. And I think that there are many things that are being promoted where people are saying that Muslims need to do X. Muslims need to do X in order to be successful. Muslims need to do X in order to promote the community and grow and improve. And it turns out that what they're saying we need to do, that X, is the exact opposite of what should be done. The exact opposite of what should be done. So I wanted to give you examples of this. I want to give you examples and what I would like is eventually for uh, in the Q&A if we get to that before Aisha for you guys to ask me and push back. Maybe you disagree and you can give your thoughts, give your point of view and we can discuss it. Okay. So depending on how you react to some of the things that I say, it might get more spicy towards the end, but we'll see, inshallah. By the way, um, how do we, what are some of the signs that things are going sideways? What are some of the indications that we have in the world that um, we're living in a clown world? And these are things that even non-Muslims are recognizing. And I was talking to these high school students about clown world, and I was saying, I was saying look, look at how depression rates have skyrocketed. You have seven-year-olds now who are taking antidepressants, right? You have uh, the suicide rate skyrocketing. People are committing suicide at younger ages. A nine-year-old recently in the news is committing suicide. So why? Why is this happening? What are the conditions that are leading to people acting in this way? Right? Look at the levels of stress. Look at the levels of anger. Look at the number of mass shootings. Mass shootings are unprecedented. When I was growing up, we didn't have this kind of news constantly about someone going to a school or a movie theater or a church and just shooting strangers, gunning them down. This is something new. This is something unprecedented. These are things that are signs for us, indications. What about shamelessness? The amount of shamelessness when it comes to promoting nudity, promoting zina, promoting all kinds of deviant sexualities, putting it in your face, putting it in the face of children, making sure that you see it everywhere you go. 
even on the street, even on public, even in the privacy of your own home, saturating the world with shamelessness. This is unprecedented. And th these are things that we should be aware of and note okay, as signs, things that were considered unspeakable. You can't even talk about such a thing without getting angry. The idea of, you know, two men together or two women together. We were talking, we were speaking with uh, an elder scholar and just mentioning the subject, he got very angry, right? In, in the kinds of words that he was using to say, of course, this is something disgusting and this is evil. And he couldn't even speak about the subject without you seeing a change in his face, right? Because that's the level of hayat, that's the level of modesty and understanding of this scholar that even talking about, having to talk about it, Okay, but guess what? They're teaching uh, six-year-olds, kindergartners, that, oh, some kids have a mom and dad. Some kids have two dads. Okay, and there's nothing wrong with that. You have to accept it. Okay? Some women like to dress like women. Some women like to dress like men. Some men like to dress like women. And they're bringing these people, these, you know, what they call transgendered people, into elementary schools, into public schools, putting it in your face. Look at it, look at it, look at it, accept it. So this is a clown world. Okay? Everything is turning upside down. And we know that this is the nature of this is the nature of dunya, of course. Okay? The nature of dunya is that what you see as being solid as seeming impermeable is all going to be destroyed right it's illusory it's temporary so that's the nature of dunya but now in we know that from what the prophet sallallahu has told us informed us and warned us of is that things will get worse towards the end of times that what seems to be good is actually very evil in the eyes of people. What's in the eyes of people seems to be bad is actually good. And that the believers will be like strangers because of this. Because we stick to Amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi anil munkar. Enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. So this is uh, some of the things that we see around us. And Muslims, unfortunately, are being affected. And we see the signs of this. We see the levels of stress. We see the levels of depression. We see the level of suicide, all skyrocketing, drug usage, shamelessness. These are things that even a non-Muslim can understand and recognize. Okay, so going back to specifically the Muslim community. People are saying the Muslim community needs to do X if it wants to succeed. And it turns out that that X is exactly the opposite of what the Muslim community should be doing. First example that I'll give is this. If the Muslim community wants to be successful, then masajid, scholars, um, MSAs, Muslim Student Associations, need to be more tolerant. They need to be more open. They need to be more gentle, less strict. We need to be more kind and accommodating. Okay? We need to relax the rules, basically. If we really want to be able to attract Muslims and non-Muslims to come to the masjid, to come to the MSA, Okay, just relax a little bit. Take it easy. Why are you driving people away with your harshness? This is not the way. We have to be kind. The sunnah means to be kind. Okay? This is the message that we're giving over and over and over again. Okay? And if you keep hearing the same thing repeatedly, you start thinking that, oh, well, it's unquestionable. It's unquestionable. But is this really what we have seen? Okay. I think that this kind of messaging really took off after 
Okay, if you're old enough, you might have noticed this shift between post 9/11 versus pre 9/11. But this kind of compat what some call or term compassionate orthodoxy, okay, which in reality is not orthodox at all, uh, took off after 9/11. And was being preached uh, from many quarters and many masajid. Many national organizations took this kind of as their standard doctrine. But what are the results? 9-11 was almost two decades ago. Okay? It's a long time. What has been the result of this kind of uh, ideology and approach? Are we seeing so many people come into the masjid that weren't coming before? Are we seeing stronger iman from our youth? Are we seeing more taqwa? Are we seeing a closeness to Allah? Has the level of thirst and desire and knowledge of the thirst for knowledge in the community just shot through the roof? Because so many people are just coming to the masjid. They're so attracted. Oh, mashallah, you guys are so nice. I just want to, you know, pray extra in the masjid. Is this the kind of, look, I'm not saying, so something important to distinguish here. Is kindness a part of the sunnah? Of course. I'm not denying that. Is being gentle, is being understanding, is being empathetic, is being sympathetic part of the sunnah? Absolutely. I'm not questioning this at all. But we have to recognize when sympathy is an excuse or empathy or gentleness is an, is an excuse to violate the commands of Allah. Things have boundaries. There are lines. There are limits. There's hudud. Tilka hudud Allah. You have to be aware of where those lines are. It's not an absolute principle that no matter what a person says, no matter what a person thinks, no matter what a person feels, you prioritize their feelings, no matter what. Where, where, where in the sunnah is this given, this attitude? No, there's always a limit. And there's also the concept of gradualness, of course. Someone just converts and becomes a Muslim, or someone is not really that devoted because of where they are in their lives to Islam. Yeah, of course, you have to be gentle. You have to ease them in. Of course, this is a part of the sunnah, part of Islam. But there's a difference between our personal interactions one-on-one -on -one with individuals, friends, family, neighbors, community members, relatives. There's a difference between that and having this being advertised. Okay? advertising certain things so many examples like for example if we want let's talk about LGBT which I've already referred to right when it comes to LGBT this is something that's very sensitive Muslims have become Muslim youth segments of them have become very sensitive to the LGBT issue and they it has reached a level where they're even scandalized if they hear the ayat regarding Qawm Lut, the, the people of Lut, ISM. Right? So does that mean their sensitivity and their feelings should come above and beyond and be prioritized over teaching these ayat? Explaining what the Sharia has to say? about this kind of behavior, explain having that kind of attitude. I mentioned this elder scholar and how his face changed in anger and how he started speaking by even hearing about this issue. What was his state? What was in him that created that kind of reaction? And do we have that within ourselves? Are we transmitting that to our youth? If we're not, why not? If we can't, why can't we? Because that's a loss. That's a loss. If this exists amongst the ulama, 
the inheritors of the prophet, prophets, and we're not transmitting that. We're not transmitting that to the next generation. Okay, then how are they going to transmit it to their kids? And their kids after that. That means a, one aspect of Islam we have failed to transmit. This is serious. Even if one ayah of the Quran, we fail to transmit it as a community, think of the implications of that. That means if the next generation doesn't have it, the ones after that won't have it and so on. We've deprived them. We've deprived potentially millions and billions. This is the amana. This is the trust that we have been entrusted with. If we want to claim to be believers. So this is very serious. And ayat, but it's not just ayat. Sunnah, okay? And states, states of the heart. Are we transmitting these things? But if we say that, oh, no, 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 no. This is a sensitive issue, Akhi, please. Don't talk like this. Okay? Be gentle. Okay, yes, gentleness in personal interaction, of course. We have to understand people's place. And for every place, there's a right way to speak, of course. But then what are what is our program for teaching, for educating, for transmitting the knowledge? Do we have a plan, is what I'm saying. Okay, so that was, I'm still on this point, okay, that we need to be gentle no matter what. We need to be accommodating no matter what, because this will bring people in. And my first point was, well, where are the numbers? Show me the empirical results. You made a claim that the best way if, for us to succeed and to drive people into Islam and closer to Allah is to be gentle and be accommodating and get with it culturally. Okay, Maybe we need to have more pop culture references in the khutbah. Maybe we need to you know, start referring to Game of Thrones in the khutbah. Right? More movie references. Maybe we need to start having music. Maybe we can even have dance parties. Okay? These are actual conversations, by the way, in MSAs. Right? right? Maybe, alhamdulillah, it hasn't reached the level of uh, masajid. Churches have had this conversation, churches and synagogues. And you have, even within the Jewish community, they, they split. Right? You have different denominations. You have reform, conservative, and orthodox. Uh, and I think there's maybe a reformation or whatever. But they've had that conversation and they split over it. So alhamdulillah, we haven't reached that level. But the MSAs are certainly having this conversation. We need more numbers. Okay, If we want to be successful as an MSA, that means having the most number of people. And to have the most number of people, you can't drive them away. You track them with honey. Honey. You give them what you want, what they want. You feed their desires. We're not going to segregate and separate the sexes. No, it's fine. Mix. And, and maybe we can have some cultural music. Cultural, right? Maybe we'll have belly dancing. This is real. The high school that I was at just yesterday, it's an active MSA, and there's an Asian society or an Asian Pacific society, and they want to celebrate culture. Alhamdulillah, I wasn't Muslims organizing it, but they brought a belly dancer to the school to perform for the children. I was shocked. This is all in the name of cultural diversity and understanding. <laughs> Something very inappropriate for children by even non-Muslim standards, but now it's happening. So, so where are the numbers? There was a study that was... Uh, published in a research journal and was covered in the Washington Post where these reach researchers looked at churches and they wanted to see church numbers. Which churches are most successful at attracting new members and retaining new members? And what they found was contrary to what many people expect. What they found was that the churches that are the most strict the churches that have the most stringent requirements for their members, okay, you have to come to church 
multiple times in the week. You have to pay a certain amount of uh, money to the church, a certain percentage of your salary that's very high. You have to dress in a certain way. Your women have to be covered in a certain way. We have complete segregation. We don't have music. We follow a very strict ritualistic practice within uh, these different days of the week. Those churches were successful in bringing new people and retaining them. Whereas the churches that didn't do these kinds of things and were more willing to accommodate certain kinds of cultural practices, were more willing to mix the genders, were more willing to say, look, just come as you are, dress however you want, act however you want. It's all about love. It's all about understanding and toleration and diversity. Those churches are shuddering. Those churches are shuddering. Why? What is the explanation for this? And so the researchers gave an explanation. They said, look, uh, what is happening is that when the churches start introducing mixing and music and just do whatever you want, this kind of attitude that everything is acceptable, there's a number of things that happen. First of all, you justify that kind of behavior and give it religious legitimacy. And when you give it religious legitimacy, then that the people who are inclined to do those kinds of things think that, well, why do I have to go to the church? If I want to enjoy music, I won't go to the church to hear like the Christian rock group. I'll go to the uh, music festival. I'll go to the concert. And it's religiously legitimate because the church is doing it, so I might as well just do it in this other way. And anyway, why do I even have to go to the church? It's all about love. God is going to accept me no matter what. Okay? No one has told me otherwise. So what's the point to be involved with the church? What's the point to read the Bible? What's the point to try to have uh, piety, taqwa, right? Everything is fine. So that's one reason. The other reason is another interesting con counterintuitive aspect is that when you have uh, a higher bar of acceptance, then it really requires sincerity to meet that, right? If you have to, uh, because religion is something that, unfortunately, can be used by people for dunyawi ends. Okay? This is nifaq, this is hypocrisy. And there's different levels of hypocrisy, of course. But one level is that you, you really don't believe but you're taking on the actions and the practices, maybe even the clothing of a religious person for your own personal ends, material ends. You're enriching yourself, you're achieving uh, acceptance within a community to get married, whatever, to get a job, whatever. Okay, But if there is an, a higher bar of what you have to do, then that will dissuade the hypocrites. I don't want to go through all that and jump through all of those hoops in order to, you know, get some kind of material material gain. That's too much. So what ends up happening is that the more sincere people are the ones who are going to the church because they truly value, they understand that putting their desires to the side, going through hardship, struggling, right? Struggling for the sake of a higher end, for the sake of God, is worth it. And so they're, by nature of the, the higher bar, they're more sincere. So those are stronger members of these churches and, and so on and so forth. So we see the opposite. We're told that, okay, be kind and gentle, lower your standards, and that will attract people. And the exact opposite is the reality. The exact opposite is what we see. Another point we are told, and this is something that I had heard for quite a while. Maybe you've heard it as well. To be successful in this country, we as Muslims need to follow the Jews. Is this something that you've heard? Or it's been implied? I've heard it. I've heard it a lot. And what's pointed to is that, look, the Jewish community is so successful in terms of their wealth, in terms of their political access, 
their positions in the universities, their positions in media, their positions as executives and CEOs. How they have reached this level of success where 2% of the population is, you know, 30% of all CEOs and academics and so forth. We'll put that question aside. But the question that I want to, uh, or the claim that I want to focus on is that Muslims have in the Jews a kind of model. They are such a small minority, but they're able to achieve so much and to have so much political power. Okay. What's sad is that Muslims who are claiming this or implying this, either implicitly or explicitly, don't mention the spiritual state. Obviously, they're non-Muslims, but even by the own, their own standards of religiosity. Did you know that 50% of all Jews are atheists? 50%. Because they consider being Jewish a ethnicity. So you can be an atheist Jew or an agnostic Jew. Right? So when you look at the Jewish community, 50% is atheist. And there's a very interesting article that was published, I believe, in The Atlantic, um, where a Jewish American was saying that the title of it was How Liberalism Has Destroyed Judaism in America. So he's, he's giving different stats. And he, what, one of the stats that he re referenced was from Pew. And Pew asked Jewish Americans, what does it mean to be a Jew? And so the respondents said things like, first, number one, first and foremost, is love for Israel. Right? That was the number one thing. But then what's number two or number three? Um, love of Jewish food, uh, appreciation for humor, um, you know, closeness to your uh, Jewish relatives. And then way at the bottom of the list is uh, adherence to Jewish law. Okay. So their, their sense of aqidah and, and belief in God wasn't even on the list. Right? That's not really a factor for being, a, for being Jewish. Following Jewish law was there, like kosher and so forth, but it was at the very bottom of the list. Most Jews don't think that that's really important for being Jewish. So this article was talking about how liberalism has contributed to this. And so this is something that we should think about very carefully. If this is where Jews have ended up, Christians to a large degree have ended up, is this really the model that we want to follow? Is this the path that we want to go? When we know that the Prophet ﷺ has said that we will follow the Jews and the Christians step by step even unto a lizard hole meaning even unto that degree of stupidity or depravity or for distance between us and Allah to that extent we would follow Jews and Christians yet some want to advocate that as Muslims we follow their political model their economic model their business model how they are you know in the positions that they are in the world today. Another example of a failed or a strategy that will fail us if we pursue it. Oh, another big aspect, I think, of Jewish discourse which Muslims need to be very wary of is, uh, and this article that I referenced by the Jewish American uh, cites this point too, because he, the author was noting how much uh, the Holocaust plays in the lives and the consciousness of Jews. Even Jews who are young, who are, have no connection to anything that happened in Germany in the 1940s. But the idea that, okay, we're victims of this Holocaust. We're victims. We've been victimized. And so this is a part, this is what Jewish uh, people around the world are saying so this is not me okay for anyone who is recording this <laughs> uh, they know that this is a problem because it's leading to a kind of a victimized psychological state okay we're constantly in the state of fear we're constantly 
feeling like we're on the brink of another Holocaust, another genocide. And how does that, what kind of effect does that have on your spirit? It has a huge effect. Because if you're constantly thinking that you falsely, wrongly thinking that you're on the brink of genocide, then you're going to be much more willing to compromise your principles. You're going to be much more willing to be you know, pragmatic and say, look, we don't need to adhere to these kinds of Jewish laws, religious laws. We need to fit in. We need to blend in and hide ourselves because we're otherwise we're going to be massacred. When in reality, you're the most wealthy. You're the most powerful. You're the most influential. But you're still considering yourself to be on the brink of uh, mass extinction. It's huge spiritual harm. So what happens, what is happening in the Muslim consciousness in the West? What is the big term? Islamophobia. And, and the people who are talking about Islamophobia and promoting this concept are explicit that this is the analogous term to anti-Semitism. Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, two sides of the same coin. And what I write about and what I talk about is that are we really thinking about what the adoption of this term is going to do for our community? What is going to happen to our mindset if we're constantly seeing ourselves as victims on the brink of being thrown into concentration camps? I'm not saying that Muslims have it easy, obviously, even, even in this country, right? But even though in this country it's nothing like what Muslims are experiencing in Burma or China or Yemen or Syria, nonetheless, okay, is it... Is the attitude of the believer one of victimization or is it one of strength and uh, fortitude and confidence that yes, we're suffering and we're being killed and oppressed simply because we say la ilaha illallah, of course. But guess what? We have dua. We have Allah. Okay? We have the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And his intercession on our behalf. We have all of these things. We have the du'a of the oppressed. What could be more powerful than that? No, we're not victims. We're just biding our time because we know that success in this life and in this world for the believers will come. Allah has promised it. And of course in the akhirah. So the victim, so what happens if you have that attitude? If you have that attitude, you're not going to compromise. You're not going to throw the Quran and Sunnah under the bus because you realize that is exactly what is going to lead to success. That is exactly what is going to save us. That is exactly what is going to bring us to the top in the in the dunya. The guidance of Allah, of course. Of course. Why would we compromise that? If we compromise that, what's going to happen? Well, we see with other religious communities. Okay. Another thing that we are told that to be successful, we have to have this. We have to throw away the cultural baggage. We have to throw away the cultural baggage if we are going to su succeed. This is another very wrong message right? and, and a dangerous message. And and what makes a message or an idea dangerous is if it if it has a small bit of truth in it. If it has a small bit of truth in it, that makes it all the more dangerous. Why? Because you introduce the idea using that small bit of truth. And then you can weaponize it in order to do a lot of damage. So yes, of course, there are many aspects of cultures in the Muslim world that are contrary to the Quran and Sunnah, contrary to Islam. Yes, of course, no doubt about it. You know, like, for example, my parents are from Iran. In Iran, one practice is that to get married, the woman and her family, the bride, has to give money and has to provide, right, this kind of dowry. Yeah, this is clearly contrary to 
Islam and it's a bad practice and it causes a lot of damage and it harms women, yes, we need to abolish this. No doubt about it. But what else is packaged within this idea okay, of throwing away culture from back home? When I grew up, my parents are more secular. Okay? They're more secular in many different ways. And I grew up as a kind of more cultural Muslim. Yeah, I, and, and many uh, Persian Americans are, are more uh, secular when they come to the U.S. But when I started learning more about Islam, I started becoming more practicing in high school and college. I kind of had a very immature attitude that, oh, my parents really are ignorant and they don't really know much about religion. I'm learning and, you know, they you know, don't have that same kind of attitude about religion and this is bad. I mean, it was just true to a certain extent, but that kind of attitude that I had was, I realize now, was very wrong. Because even though I was not raised as a practicing Muslim, I was raised as a Iranian, as a Persian. And the amazing thing about Persian culture, and this is shared in South Asian culture, Indian culture, Pakistani culture, Bangladeshi culture, Turkish culture, Malaysian culture, Egyptian culture, so on and so forth, is that Islam is embedded within the culture. Islam is embedded within the culture. And so things like how to treat elders with respect, and there's something in, in Farsi, like one example, is taruf. Taruf, maybe you've heard of this in, in South Asian or Arab culture. And is that you have to serve people, your guests. You have to be very hospitable. You have to be very respectful with your parents, how you talk to them, okay? To such an extent, like when you extend something like a glass of water to, to a guest or to your father, and just don't stick it out like this. It's very rude. Okay? You, you present it. You gently place it, okay? To that extent, such small details. Where is this coming from? It's Islam. This is embodied, practiced Islam. It's part of the culture. It's part of the culture. And many other examples, okay? How to treat the opposite sex. My parents, okay, weren't allowing me, for example, to go and spend nights at friends, non-Muslim friends' houses, okay? And just go and be loose and do the whole American culture thing. That was not what Iranians do. That's not what good Iranian children do. It's, it's foreign to the culture of Iran, this kind of behavior. And I, I'm not saying that there's anything inherently wrong with you know, a sleepover, but the idea of just being loose, that was not part of the culture. Having a girlfriend or boyfriend was not part of the culture. They didn't, con they didn't conceive of it as, oh, this is contrary to fiqh. This is something that is haram. Uh, it in, entails touching or looking or halwa or things like this. They weren't thinking it, of it in a legalistic sense. But that was the culture. The culture was embedded with all of that information. So this is what uh, is so important about Muslim cultures. Okay? And we have to be very careful not to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Another uh, dangerous aspect of this idea of oh, we have to throw away culture, is that it has implications for our connection with elders, and specifically elder ulama. How is this? Because those elders are coming from those cultures, and they're behaving and acting according to those cultures. And many of the things that we think, oh, this is just cultural, sometimes we don't even recognize that, no, this is actually a sunnah that you don't have any idea about. You're just not aware of it. Okay? If we throw away culture, then we're losing access to that sunnah. 
And we're also marginalizing, belittling, even if only in the only in, in our minds or consciousness, the status of the ulama and the scholars. And we hear this growing up. I heard this often. And sometimes we hear it from popular speakers that, look, we need American Islam. Okay? We need American Islam. And to have American Islam, you need to have relevant, homegrown, born and raised Amer American imams. If, and, and this is actually part of the policy of some masajid. Like they write it into the rules that to hire an imam, the imam has to be homegrown. It has to be American. And he, he can't speak with an accent. Right? So even, even having that kind of rule on the books, what does that do for your understanding of elders? This idea that elders just don't get it. The, you know, Mulvi, the Mullah, he just doesn't understand our situation. This is ignorance. This is very stupid. You're cutting yourself off. We're cutting ourselves off from Islam. Remember what I said about tradition. How do we get Quran and Sunnah? It's from them. And many of the things, all of the things that we're experiencing in terms of the challenges of modernity, they also experience because modernity is not something new. Okay, it's 200 years, 200 years of modernity. And we can say that modernity was introduced into the Muslim world with the colonization of Egypt by the French, Napoleon, which happened at the big, uh, end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. That's the beginning of modernity and its confrontation and rape of the Muslim world through colonization. Our elders went through that. And, and they experienced the tawfiq. Why? Because they came through it as believers to such an extent that they're transmitting the knowledge and the Quran and the Sunnah in, in the many ways that they do to us. So that's that's the tawfiq. Are we going to be able are we going to survive? Our situation, these pressures, and be able to uh, imitate them in this, recreate their success? Are we up for that challenge? We're not even recognizing their success. We're belittling them. We don't want them to be teaching us. We don't want them to be the imam of, of the masjid. If we have this guy with an accent giving the khutbah, who's going to come to the masjid to listen to the khutbah? We need to have a khatib that's going to make movie references for the youth to come. This is ignorant. It's very, it's short-sighted. It's myopic. The best imams that I have heard, okay, even back when I, you know, was more ignorant than I'm than I am now. The best khutbas, the best halaqat, the best durus were from people who had very heavy accents. And we're not from here. Okay? The most insight and the most knowledge, okay? the most adab, akhlaq, it came from them. But we're trying to uh, marginalize and put them to the side. Okay, should we get a little bit spicy? <laughs> or should we just skip the spice and go to Q&A? <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe we have 15 minutes. Uh, let's get spicy. And then that will generate ho hopefully more questions. So what was the whole theme of the discussion? Things that we're being told we have to have to, in order to be successful as a community. Things that we're told we have to have. So what were they? I mean, there's many, but I focused on a few things. Like we need to be more tolerant and accommodating in order to attract more people. 
Uh, we need to follow other model minorities like Jews in, in the kinds of things that they do. Uh, we need to throw away culture and we need leaders and imams who are relevant and who get it. Um, so another thing, you know, we can talk about the idea that we have to have women's visibility. Women need to be visible. Women need to be at the forefront. Women need to be on stage. Women have to be. We have to have Muslim women on every single panel, on every single board, on every single council. They have to be in front, leading the charge. Have you heard this? Is this really going to bring success? I mean, we you don't need me to tell you the answer to this question. This question has been discussed and explained in depth in our tradition, based on statements of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on this topic. And, you know, you guys can learn about this in your classes, inshallah, and maybe Sheikh Mateen can, you know, introduce, introduce some of these texts. Um, but let's just take a step back. What is visibility? And is this really, uh, you don't need to have a in-depth knowledge and to be a scholar to recognize on its face that this is contrary to Islam. You, you don't need to be a uh, an alim and to you pour through the Torah to really recognize this. Visit, what is women's visibility? It means to, to show yourself. To be in front of people so that they can see you and gaze upon you. Is this conformant with, aligned with haya, with modesty? Is this what Islam promotes? It promotes the opposite. It promotes the opposite of this. And in fact, that's how Islamic society has been structured. And how Islam has been practiced. Were the female companions of the Prophet وسلم, were they standing in front of the masjid? Were they going to the mimbar and making, you know, giving bayans, giving speeches? Do we see any female scholars or the wives of the Prophet? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Were they were they doing this? Have you heard of a story like this? If not, then what does that tell you? Are we going to achieve success by abandoning the practices of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the practice of the Sahaba? I mean, your analysis doesn't have to extend beyond that. Like just take it seriously. Is this really guidance? And this goes back to the point that I started with. If you have if you have internalized modernity, if you've internalized this idea that humanity is on a continuous trajectory of progress, then you might think that we know something now that they were ignorant of. You might be deluded into thinking that. But we reject this. We, re we understand that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sahaba, the, the Salaf, they were at the peak of human existence. They were at the peak of rationality and morality, of course. Things have devolved, getting worse every single year, every single month. How can we know something that they did not know? And if you take it to the logical conclusion, this will lead you to kufr. Very clear and simple. It is enough to reflect on the seerah 
it is enough to reflect on the example of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba. It's enough. Visibility. This idea that's coming from a foreign philosophy, foreign ideology, that you have to be visible, you have to be seen to have power. No, no one accepts this. The most powerful organizations in the world are unseen. I don't mean rape, I mean they're just, they're secretive. They act covertly. That is the secret to their power. They're not known, they're not seen. They operate in the shadows. Okay. The biggest celebrities, okay? not celebrities, let's say the biggest, most powerful CEOs, the most wealthy billionaires, are they going out showing themselves you know making it rain with the money no they're in tinted cars their mansions are invisible because they surround them with trees right they don't want to be seen okay? power hides itself so even on the basic level a non-muslim kafir can recognize this the illogic of this that you have to have visibility to have power so let me clarify this. Am I saying that women have no role? Women have no importance? Women should have no influence? We should not care at all about what women need and what they want and what they think is right and wrong? That's not what I'm saying. Please, I beg you, do not take this uh, message as if I, that's what I'm saying. That's because that's not what I'm saying. Okay? Yes, of course, we have to have consideration and the Prophet ﷺ did consult with his wives, the mothers of the believers. Of course, many examples of this. Um Salama, Aisha, even Fatima. And he showed utmost cons concern for their well-being and utmost care and mercy and kindness and gentleness. But we have to make distinctions. Okay, We have to understand nuances. We have to understand what that is, which is what we have to do. This is what is the sunnah. And what is being advocated, that no, we have to put our women out in front of everyone and show them, expose them. They need to be on the covers of the magazines. They need to be wearing the burkini. They need to be doing this and that and that and that. They need to be leading everyone. They need to be on all the panels and on and on and on. We have to make distinctions. We have to create these nuances in our minds. This is what being intelligent means, what being rational means, right? Having foresight. Okay. 